Benvenuti. My name is Clarissa Clau and I'm uh, the director of the Italian program. I'm the chair of uh, the Department of European Studies here at San Diego State. And uh, I just wanna uh, express my uh, uh, excitement for uh, this event. Uh, we're thrilled to have uh, uh, our two guests, uh, Candy, guests, Candice Whitney and Barbara Fosu-Somoa with us. I um, wanna take a, a few minutes to just introduce, to welcome you, to welcome uh, our students. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this presentation that is entitled uh, Translating Afro-Italian Blackness, Considering Gender is uh, uh, the first one in our uh, series on Imagine uh, Black Europe. Um, and uh, uh, we, I want to acknowledge my uh, colleagues who are here, who are also part of this. It's co-sponsored by the Italian program, but also by the uh, Department of European Studies, the Center of European Studies, uh, Africana, the Department of Africana Studies, and the Department of Women's Studies at San Diego State. Um, I also want to uh, acknowledge, uh, I want to say a few words about uh, land acknowledgement. San Diego State sits on the unceded land of the Kumeyaay, and uh, um, you know, that have lived here for millennia. and. Uh, um, in this land and across the border, the border uh, is a, a construction uh, of, uh, of late. Um, I also want to introduce, uh, want to say that this week uh, marks, uh, for those of us in Italian study, this week is the uh, oh. week of the um, Italian language in the world. And, uh, even more so, I'm uh, excited to have uh, this particular presentation that we'll discuss. Uh, we are, we are. All right, uh, please uh, mute yourself. Uh, um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce our guest speakers and then we're gonna let them talk uh, a little bit. Okay, so Candice Whitney is a researcher, writer and international education professional based in New Jersey. Uh, in 2016 and 17, she was a Fulbright scholar in Italy and she conducted research that explored how the diversity of African women's and the entrepreneurial projects interrogate and challenge uh, stereotypes about the African diaspora in Italy. Uh, she's also co-curator and co-host of the virtual salons discussion on Black Italia webinar series at NYU's Casa Italiana, uh, Marie, uh, Zerilli Marimo, and also, uh, you know, Last but not least, uh, Candice Whitney received her BA in Anthropology and Italian at Mount Holyoke College. Um, Barbara uh, ofosu Somoa is a researcher, writer, and emerging Italian to English translator from Accra, Ghana, and the Bronx, New York. Uh, as a translator, uh, Barbara attempts to bring the works of contemporary Afro-Italian writers to English-speaking audiences um, and uh, she has received uh, both the Thomas J. Watson and also the Fulbright Research Fellowships to investigate the racialized lived experiences of Black people, primarily women, across the African diaspora. During her Fulbright uh, year in Italy, uh, Barbara concurrently um, uh, Barbara collaborated with various uh, uh, Black Italian organizations and collectives as they unpack the reality of concurrently embodying uh, both, uh, the, um, both Italian and Blackness um, in a culture that uh, this we must acknowledge, unfortunately, per still perceives both identities as incompatible. Uh, Barbara Fosa Somoa has a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology, Psychology, and Italian from Middlebury College. Welcome, Candice and Barbara. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is uh, exciting. Please take it away. Uh, share your screen. We are excited to hear from you. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Barbara and I are really excited to be here. Um, for getting started, we're going to do uh, two readings to just help uh, situate our uh, talk for today and our um, and our conversation. So I put some links in the chat. Um, I'm going to just jump right on in. Barbara, is there anything you want to add before? Jump right on in? Okay. Um, right. Quickly, Candice um, lost her voice last week and is recovering, so um, that might be what you might be hearing as well. Yes. Thanks, Barbara. Okay. So I'm going to get started with uh, reading um, a translation um, that I did by uh, Jada Khan. Uh, she um, is a writer based, um, well, from Naples um, with Ghanaian roots. And um, she performed a piece called Sumai Lasako, Story of the Good Life, uh, back in uh, 2018, um, just um, after Sumai Lasako was murdered by a white supremacist in Calabria. So I'm going to read that uh, to you all now. Now that I'm dying, my face becomes everyone's. Now that I'm dying, First, I become a thief, then a victim of hate, then a thief again, then a hopeless nigger, a nigger without recourse. But at the end of this sad, sad merry-go-round, that renewed stay permit absolves me of all my sins. It will prevent me from being buried under the label illegal alien. I can already hear their voices in my head, the voices of journalists and lawyers, those who reek of politics and wear starched black suits. They're so arrogant. Their skin is white and pure. Their skin seems as if it doesn't have secrets, but it's like it does have secrets. Just because it seems clean doesn't mean that it's not dirty, that it doesn't have a few secrets. Don't trust appearances or what they say. I didn't trust them then and I don't trust them now. I see them handle my suffering violently and carelessly as though it were burning embers, red with blood and unsettled rage to be extinguished and drowned with water and salt, water from the sea. Italy saves me, Italy sentences me. Now that I'm dying, my face suddenly becomes everyone's. But I don't know you or you or even you. And I don't know you and you or even you. I don't know any of you. You down there demanding justice for me, pronouncing my name with the wrong accents and rhythm. Your eyes are too calm to really picture me. You simply can't, white man over there, stand on my side because you're alive and I'm still dead. Because we walk side by side and you hope that maybe one day we can all look alike and be equals but history has made us and divided us. Now that I'm dying, something strange is happening around me. My face exists, it's real. When I was alive, I worked so hard that I forgot how it felt to look in the mirror. Photos of my face are everywhere now. People use images of my face on social media and on the news to condemn and judge me. They do it to prove to themselves how poor and desperate I was, what a migrant, I was. I remember my small, narrow face a bit differently, though. Not as niggerly as everyone else now sees it, but thinner, more delicate, and invisible. I was so young, and they chose the worst photo of me, but that's not really who I am. I'm not a person who goes out with messy hair or who has a face that looks like they've been sleep deprived their entire life. Those who feel pity looking at my stunned face should have seen me when I took to the streets with my brothers and we protested with the essential workers union. We were farm hands, so we raised our fists and went on strike, even if we were tired and aware of our feudal landowners hatred in that valley of Joya Tauro, where we were and still are slaves. We shouted that in this foreign country, yes, we were workers, not pack animals ready to be slaughtered. We continue to shout that our work counts just as much as a white man's, that a black man has the right to a safe work environment and a welcoming home to rest his head 
in fair living conditions in an impossible world. That we had to stop these new slave owners from combing through these vast plantations with their short barreled guns. We protested that we were men. I, Somaila Sako, was a man. Truly, I tell you, this tough, arid land called Calabria, which humiliated and keeps humiliating me, is not what killed me. Because the skin that I leave on this land will become separated from my flesh and blood sooner or later. Time will make it happen, death already has. And then what? People will forget what it meant to mourn for a migrant who isn't rooted to any place, just as the word implies, and who hears his life described as an obscure, weightless cloud, empty and ir irrelevant. A migrant is like a cloud that's pushed by a wind that blows from afar. It gets stuck in lands, but never grows roots anywhere. So I was not a migrant. None of us are. I'd like you to stop calling us migrants from now on because it's here in Italy we have ended up on your shore. You don't see us, and when you do, you project your uncivilized heart of darkness fantasies onto us. But if you drink and breathe and sweat and love in a country that is no longer yours, then you are, you are not a migrant, you are a man. Different, maybe, but still a man, no longer a migrant. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is already here. Other men and women will die just like me, maybe in even worse ways. And they too will leave behind nothing but their skin, marvelous, imperfect, thick, delicate, the color of the earth that we tilled and nurtured so that it would give us back the beauty of life. We are farmhands, but the people who loved us and were able to resist this assassin that is Europe will breathe life into our skin. It won't, be weak, it won't be our weak and broken flesh that gives us our lives back, but rather the deep, hot breath of those who believe justice exists, even for a Black man who walks on his own two feet. A Black man who doesn't crawl, but walks. The nigger is dead. It's true. But maybe he was stealing. He had a legal stay permit. The motive, they speculate it was revenge for a theft. Revenge, revenge, revenge. And now I'll pass it to Barbara for her reading. So I'll be reading a translation um, of a text that I, was written by Marie Moise, who is an Italian Haitian um, writer activist living in uh, Florence, New York, uh, Florence, Italy. And this is a story that she wrote based on her family's experience of passing as white for many generations in Italy until she discovered her own blackness. And this is an excerpt from a longer piece. It's called, We Cried a River of Laughter. I was born in a family bleached by an unexpected split. I spoke my first words in the language that forced my father, his sisters, and my father's fathers to forget their owls. I inherited only one noticeable trait of their foreignness, this unusual and unpronounceable surname, Moise, with the two dots on the eye. But for the rest, born to a biracial Haitian man and a white Italian woman, I was raised to be normal amongst the normals, unlike my father, grandfather, and aunties. For an entire lifetime, I grew up without a past. My family preferred to silence it rather than to confine me to a black past. Yet I inherited a surname with a slave origin. Moise means Moses in French, and its etymological definition is saved from the water. It is one of those biblical names that slave owners gave to slaves transplanted to, it, to Haiti from Africa. With the rite of Catholic baptism, they raised the lives that those enslaved bodies had known before their deportation. The new name, in the colonizer's language, marked the beginning of the new non-existence in subhuman conditions. Moise saved from the waters. What a more fitting name for a body that survived the torture of a forced transatlantic journey. Once they arrived in Italy, the Moise be family began to accept calling themselves by the Italian version by also pronouncing that surname's E, Moise. The French pronunciation in which the closing E is phonetically silenced was reserved for family members who remained on the other side of the ocean. Nevertheless, 
normality was my inheritance. And so even though they Italianized my surname, every time I had to create a family tree at school, those severed roots came out. I saw in the strange expressions on the faces of those around me that I, after all, was not a normal person like them. So I began to wonder, and I began to ask many questions. Yet I always received only a few brief answers, as if there were nothing to know, as if there were no words to respond to me, or that those words were too painful to utter. There is white normality, then there is the opposite. The opposite of normal is not merely abnormal. Normality defines who has the power to make you feel wrong, to sanction you as inferior, to brand you as a failure. Thus, the opposite, the opposite of white, white normality is failure. I was born white to those who failed to be white. I was born and raised with the implicit responsibility to cancel the mark, hide the unspeakable from which I originated, and break the chain of failure. I grew in the anguish of having to disguise an original shame. I did not learn my father's language. I had never seen his homeland, and I didn't know my family's story. I was white, yet normality was an affliction. Failure is a mark that is passed on from father to child from the colonial era. The colonized, the enslaved people could not meet the full dignity of man. And because of this, my father could, could never entirely fulfill the role of father. In fact, the only possible version of fatherhood is that of the head of household who imposes his authority on his wife and children. Since the time of slavery in Haiti, only the master of the enslaved, the white colonizer, could be a father. Man is an intrinsically white gender category. The enslaved woman is the only biological parent legally recognized. The black man has historically been black because he is, because of his failures as a father, because he is a failure as a father. My father was the father until I finished elementary school. Soon he hurtled into oblivion. He stopped dedicating the weekends to his kids or giving money to my mother. He never had any money for us. And when we asked him for some, he disappeared. He'd reappear months later and then disappear again. His father had done the same thing. My dissident grandfather was more often in prison than at home with his family. My grandmother and her children had the task of encouraging him, of giving him the strength to resist by greeting him from beneath his cell window. Once they arrived in Italy, they had only my grandmother's salary. Grandfather found ways to squander it. In the end, soon after they divorced, he also disappeared. I could not learn their language. I am not black like them, and I knew nothing about their past. Yet there is an illness that I suffer that I suffer from, which is not whiteness. It's the curse of your Haitian family, my, one, my white mother once told me. A type of defective gene, she said, that I inherited from my black side. I don't know what happened inside of them when they abandoned Haiti. Perhaps my grandfather was already mad when, when a second before illegally embarking for Europe, he raised a fist and salute to his homeland, for, his, for which he never stopped fighting. It is one of the few things that I found out about him from my father. The ignorance of children protected auntie and dad. Still, they only had the length of the transit language journey to become old enough to face this new world and its whiteness. I'll we'll pause there. I'll also post a link in the chat. Folks can um, read more if they want to. It felt important um, to start with excerpts from, from some of the work that we're translating. So Candace and I are currently in the process of working um, on translating a book um, the first of its kind that was published in 2009. In Italy, it's called Future. Um, it's a collection of stories, fiction, nonfiction, um, speculative, creative, et cetera, written by a group of Black Italian women speaking about their experiences in Italy. And for two of us, uh, two Black women, I was born in Ghana, raised in New York. Candice is um, African-American, grew up in New Jersey, who found ourselves, right, through our academic journeys in Italy, the story of blackness and how it exists and, and shows up and it's embodied in, in Italy was very important to us. Um, and we found ourselves through our Fulbright, through study abroad experiences and now through the translation project, really thinking about how does blackness sort of show up um, in reality in the lived experiences of people who are you know, living in a country that has gone through a historical project of erasing its white history, of its black history, right? Has really sought out to become white um, in a process of, of becoming in attachment to Europe, thus, you know, alienating a lot of people who have come there either through migration, some folk who were there through um, Italy's attempts to colonize Libya um, and other countries like, like that. And so this project that we're working on is really thinking through what that um, process is. We wanted to um, share 
a little bit because when you think about race in Italy, it's such a complicated you know construction because there isn't even like the language for it, right? In the U.S., when folks are thinking about racism, there's a word. If you're thinking about anti-blackness, there's a word for that. If you're thinking about you know um, anti-black violence or you know racial bias, any of these things, even if the words don't exist, we can construct words together, and there's a way of understanding immediately what those words are meaning in practice. Um, there's an absence of that vocabulary that exists in Italy, simply because it is a culture, like I said, that has undergone a project of whiteness. Um, and so there isn't that language even to even begin the conversation. Often, if someone does something that in the United States context can be thought of as racist, um, the reaction is it's not racist, it's ignorance. And thus, you know, it's not that someone does not mean harm, they cause harm, but because they did, their intention was not meant to be, cause harm, then perhaps you can excuse that behavior. Um, Candice, do you mind sharing the slide? One particular aspect of um, thinking about racism, race, belonging, identity in the Italian context um, that we have spent a lot of time thinking about is through the, is through politics, right? Um, Italy as a country is often gendered as as feminine um, and is often gendered as you know pure white. Kind of think if you're thinking U.S. context, the Manifest Destiny, the U.S. is a woman, she's a white woman, we need to protect it. That's similar sort of. Um, reflection exists in Italy. And when you look at the political discourse of, of the far right, um, Forza Nuova, the Lega Nord, when they talk about, you know, migration in Italy, they're often talking about defending her, the, the, the imagery, right? The, imagine Italy as, as a white woman that needs protection. Um, these are two kind of images that we have here. And a lot of them are also reflected. Um, they're kind of callbacks, echoes through the history of fascism um, when Italy was going through that. So the image on the um, the image on the right, which says, um, pardon, the, the image on the right that says, um, defend, la dai nuovi misori, defend her from the new invaders, right? She could be your mother, she could be your wife, she could be your sister, she could be your daughter. Um, and, and it's often when, when, when you, the discourse happens around what migration means to the, the cultural context of Italy, it's we need to protect and safeguard this imaginary that we have of a white nation, of a white woman, of a protected space um, that needs to really um, be taken care of. And the only way you can do that is from the black man immigrant. Um, the race from that discourse often is black women, migrant women. Right, or black women, um, Ita black Italian women in any context. So Future, this project that we're working on, which is one of many, is really thinking about how do we flip that narrative, right? How do we uh, give women, black women, or women of African descent who are living in Italy, space to tell their own stories, one, and make those stories accessible beyond the Italian borderlands. Um, there's an organization, many organizations have sort of shown up in Italy right now who are doing this work. One of them is Arising Africans. And something that's really important also to think about and consider is often the, uh, the collectives that are popping up in Italy are usually run by very young people, um, typically under the age of 25. Um, now they're aging, right? Because that, that age group of people whose families arrived in the late 80s, early 90s are now coming of age. And they're really thinking about how do we claim space for ourselves? outside of the context of what is being said about us. Um, and so Rising Africans had a campaign a few years ago that says, provoghino sono clandestini, right? Refugees are not illegal. Because what was happening too within the discourse of migration, within the discourse of blackness or anti-blackness within the Italian context was that there was a conflation of everybody who was coming, who was arriving on the Italian shores or who had been born in Italy, raised in Italy, educated in Italy as a, an illegal person, right? An undocumented person, thus unwelcome, thus needing to be pushed away. Um, within that context, right, is this is this sort of connection or relationship to Italy as one white, two Christian, right? And so that kind of idea of we have to protect our Christian homeland, we have to protect is from, you know, do we want Islam in schools? Do we want a mosque in Bologna? We need, to, we need to sort of stop the invasion and kind of that rhetoric of not immigration, not a change of cultural context, not like an expansion of the capacity of who we are to grow, but like we need to protect our borderlands from any kind of infestation of, of, of the other, right? Um, of the foreign, of the unwanted. And is there a speech to this? Okay. 
Um, also, um, a couple of years ago, there was a um, fertility campaign, um, as I'm sure y'all are probably uh, familiar with, Italy's known for having low uh, fertility rates. And so the Ministry of Health, um, they uh, had put out advertisements for uh, Fertility Day, and um, they were pretty uh, racialized, as you can already just probably visually, you know, tell from the visual on the left. Um, you have um, on the left, in the image, it says, um, le buone abitudini da promuovere i cattivi compagni da abbonare stili di vita corretti per la prevenzione della sterilità e dell'infertilità, which is basically saying up top with the white folks in the back saying um, best practices to, to do to uh, promote. And on the bottom where you see um, uh, the black man on the left, folks with afros, um, the uh, bad friends to get rid of correct um, ways of living um, for the prevention of um, uh, infertility and being sterile. So essentially you see this um, advertisement from the um, state uh, attempting to affirm that um, one uh, behaviors um, or legitimate, legitimatizing um, white folks, delegitimatizing folks who um, are black. And of course, also just um, associating, um, let's say good and bad behaviors with each color. And um, what you also um, see is this uh, continuity that um, uh, the, uh, that a uh, who's considered the other is considered to be this uh, infestation, a stain, a macchia to the population. Therefore, it can't be imaginable that um, the children of immigrants or uh, yeah, children of immigrants um, and their children could possibly be contributing to the um, to the population of the nation, which is what you see here on the right, um, the Riforma Cittadinanza um, that is uh, led by different organizations in Italy that Barbara has spoken to. So Rising Africans is one. Um, there's also Queste Roma. There are um, also organizations as well um, in Rome. Um, so, yes, in Roman uh, Milan, and so it says here on the right, Volete più figli di conoscete quelli che avete già. Do you want more children? Recognize the ones that you already have. And that is because in Italy, um, with the citizenship laws, um, essentially you can get citizenship if you are uh, born by, from someone who has Italian blood or uh, previously had Italian citizenship. Um, however, if you were not born to, those, to someone with Italian blood or um, citizenship, essentially, um, you would have to apply. And the earliest you could apply for that in theory is 18, but in practice, that could mean years later, or um, also for some just becomes literally, for many becomes literally just uh, in, uh, inconceivable. Um, and so essentially you have, um, if I'm not mistaken, I'm just a little bit short of um, a million youth in Italy um, that are uh, without citizenship. Um, and so what that means is they are um, permanent residents, they are undocumented, it can just take essentially, a, you know, the whole entire um, spectrum. Um, however, they, you know, live in Italy, they go to school in Italy, they've been essentially living their lives there. Um, and um, here at the bottom, um, it says, la cittadinanza non ha età. Noi si, sono 24 anni che stiamo. So it's saying the citizenship doesn't have age, but we do. We do. Um, it's been 24 years that we've been waiting. Um, stranieri a chi? Um, a foreigner to who? So again, just a reminder that, um, you know, folks who are um, born to immigrants are um, uh, demanding that they, uh, receive citizenship um, because they um, they live there. And then of course they're all, um, and also I'll stop there. Um, and yeah, what, Bart, what I was referring to um, before, um, let's say by blood is considered to be use sanguinis. There's um, use solis, which is you get it by being um, on the land. Um, there are also debates for use culturae, which is basically saying if you go to school in Italy, therefore you are culturized as Italian per se. But, if, but what also in the end, we 
this is what I've um, seen throughout the debates is right, but there's also just a lot of tension ultimately, right, with how, um, well, citizenship is extremely important. There's also, folks also admit that there are, you know, there's always gonna be someone left out when you have um, citizenship, where then it becomes an even broader debate then of, well, then who are we disenfranchising, right? If you're advocating for yourself as someone who has been living on the land and you get citizenship, and then what about the folks that are um, called uh, profugi, who are called um, um, refugees or considered recently arrived? So there are all these um, folks in Italy are currently act, um, Black folks in Italy are currently addressing these questions through their mobilizing um, and uh, through their uh, organizing on the ground. Okay, I'll pass it back to you, Barbara. So inherent in a lot of these um, movements, and that's me with the pink scarf on the left, is, is very much the gendered kind of, there are two things that are happening here. There's a layer of gendered, um, gendered performativity, but also gendered bias and racism, anti-Blackness, um, that shows up in the law, that shows up in who is pushing for um, the laws to change, who is standing to the foreground. Um, so wh while we were both living in, in Italy, something that both Candace and I really participated in was the movement for, for citizenship. Um, and part of that, right, that move towards citizenship is really thinking about the ways that in these kind of images that we've shown you, this idea of protecting Italy, thus protecting the white women in Italy, whether through productivity, whether through um, invasion of, of, of the re uh, refugees, um, illegals, whatever. And I use quotations around all of these, right? Because they're definitions that need to be considered and unpacked. Um, but there are a lot of black women, young black women, vulnerable in a lot of ways who are putting themselves to the forefront. Something to, that's important to also consider when we're thinking about these conversations. Um, and the, for us, Candace and I, that layer of anti-blackness that sort of stepped steep through all of this is most um, most black uh, student kid, youth in Italy don't realize that they don't have citizenship until they arrive at university, right? And so being born in Italy, being raised in Italy, um, you go through the educational system fine until it's time to apply for university. And my research was in educational access and equity while I was there. And so that was the space I was spending a lot of my time. Um, when you arrive at university, you're, you're meant to apply for what in the US, right? If you have an international student coming to the US, they have to apply for a student, a version of a student visa. So having been born, raised, educated, lived their entire lives in a country that, and for which they know all the culture have never gone anywhere else. You arrive at the university age and you have to get permesso di soggiorno, a permission to stay every year in order to be able to go to university and stay there in your home, right? Um, and so a lot of these young women particularly, but not only are pushing to bring awareness to them. And that layer of genderedness is also important because often um, there is, they're completely erased from the discourse of what it is of, what, where the tension lies, right? It's protecting white women from black men um, with an ignor ignorance entirely for the black women who are also within that mix. Um, one of the ways of cultural production that's kind of be emerging as this process is going on is, is through literature, right? And Candace and I being um, translators, this is the space that we're spending a lot of our time as well. Um, in the in before, but predominantly in the past, perhaps four to five years, a lot of um, literature has come out written by Black Italian women um, or women who are uh, racialized as Black in Italy, thinking about their experiences. Some of them are really specifically thinking about what it means to exist in the black body um, within the Italian borderlands. Some of them are thinking about what it means what it means to exist in a black board body in a, in a country that was attempted to be colonized by Italy. And some of them are thinking about what it is to, what it means to exist um, period. So three of the examples that we have on the screen are Anose, which is a book that came out earlier this year, Sotto lo stesso sole, which is a young adult novel about a young woman who is um, transracially adopted into a white family um, but is a black woman and is thinking about her own identity of having been in a, com in a family that has effectively erased her blackness, right? Never acknowledged it, even though like, how can one exist within that body without necessarily having um, an acknowledgement or a space for it, right? And so coming of age and realizing, oh, I have been, my blackness, though I'm aware of it, has always been in it unexistent in my in my story in my narrative how do I then engage with that while also thinking about intimacy while also thinking about my positionality within this place Nadisha who um, the second book in the middle Unica Persona Nera Nella Stanza um, is an actually interesting um, 
person because she is um, South Asian heritage, but is red as black um, and has existed in Italy the whole time as, as because in the US and it, it's, we don't want to sort of have this conversation within the US Italy binary, but unfortunately kind of like that's the space that we have to exist because that's the point where we can sort of the point, the US is often a point of departure for a lot of these conversations. And so within the Italian context, right, she's read as black because that's all, because race is something that is hard to decipher there. Um, so this book is about, you know, being the only black person in the room, l'unica persona nera in stanza, and how that experience is to, to navigate those, right, while also understanding her South Asian identity that is erased entirely um, from that mix. Um, Ajaba Shego is an author that perhaps some of you have heard of, who's right now probably the more pro uh, prominent uh, Somali Italian writer who's thinking through, um, talking through racism, colonialization, um, racialization, both from young adults and um, for adults as well. Um, and then we have a few others. Uh, Marilena, the first book is actually quite interesting. Her father um, was a fa was an Italian fascist who um, went to who went to I believe Eritrea during um, the era of fascism. Met and fell in love with a black Eritrean woman. Had a daughter. They moved back to Bergamo, probably the heart of fascism in Italy. Um, and so she grew up as a biracial woman in the household with a father who was very outspokenly fascist, racist but obviously loved his black wife and his um, biracial daughter and that conflict of existing in this place where we cannot talk about my identity because we don't have the language for it. Um, and we can produce violence while at the same time being subject to it ourselves. Um, these are uh, two other books that recently um, came out. Well, uh, Poi Basta came out, I think, a couple years ago at this point, maybe two. Um, and this is a manifesto written by Esperance uh, um, Hakunizima uh, Ripanti. And um, in um, Esperance's uh, book, she writes this manifesto that really explores her um, just experience as um, an object as an adopted child in Italy. And then Ladri di Denti is a um, series of stories and essays written by uh, Jada Khan. And a good amount of the stories are situated in um, the area of Naples and Castel del Torno, uh, where uh, Jada is from. Um, and then here we have uh, Future, the book that Barbara and I are translating, Ultra Babylonia, which um, was written by Jabba Shego, translated by a good friend Aaron Robertson. Um, and so you can read the translation of this uh, book, uh, Beyond Babylon, published by Two Lines Press. Uh, and then La Linea del Colore. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't describe Ultra Babylonia. Um, Ultra Babylonia is. Um, this really interesting weave of um, stories about a group of women who um, are between Italy, uh, Somalia, and Argentina. Um, and it just unpacks all of these national traumas that um, weave throughout their lives, um, specifically national traumas. Um, and then La Linea do Colore came out in 2019 or early 20, yeah, 2019, I think. Um, and this one follows um, the story of La Fanu Brown, um, who is a, um, a woman who travels um, from the US to uh, Italy. Um, and you can read more about her story. It has a lot of, um, his, it's a great book for historical fiction fans. And this one is coming out as a translation, um, but the specific date that I don't have and publisher I don't have. Um, and I just also want to quickly add before we um, move along, these are just like recent books that came out, but folks in Italy have been publishing um, stories for, um, you know, as long as they've been able to get published as long as you're able to write um, and I think that um, what we're trying to also just um, indicate through this is that these are examples of texts that are making it to um, let's say broader audiences especially through like social media a lot of these authors already do have strong social media um, 
basis compared to, let's say, um, publishing in the early, sorry, in the 90s or the 2000s, um, um, where folks were definitely writing, but um, the space was just uh, different. Okay, and that concludes our presentation. I think there was one other yeah. that we wanted to talk about. So, so we, we, we've talked about kind of where we came from, how we got to Italian, how we started asking some of these questions and where these questions come from. And one main thing kind of that we wanted to share is we chose literature, but not only as, as the culture production within which we wanted to consider race, racialization, identity and belonging in Italy, because um, often, again, even though we don't want it to be, the U.S. becomes a point of departure when we're talking about racism and racialization. Um, and the language often that is leveraged for having these conversations is U.S.-centered. Um, and, and that is what it is because of where the, the U.S. kind of stands in a lot of these things. So a lot of our projects um, beyond translating into Italian, uh, out of Italian texts that are being written by Black uh, women predominantly, but not only, is because it is our effort to sort of expand the idea of where blackness exists, right? When considering blackness within and across the diaspora. Often when people think about black folks in Europe, they think about the UK, perhaps France, maybe they think about you know Germany, um, but an expansion beyond that, Italy is not a space that people often think about when they think about um, a multiracial identity, um, the context for which that is possible or impossible. I apologize, as a metro, there's something outside my door. Um, the context that makes those possible or impossible. And so within our efforts to translate them, right, it allows for, particularly with Italian departments, but not only language departments, culture departments to think, how do we expand an idea of where diaspora can exist, right? And how do we leverage diasporas in conversation to allow to think where, are, where there are similarities, where there are differences and where there are homes. But Candace and I, because we are co-translators, we spend a lot of time sitting with each other through these conversations. Um, both of us came to translation from social science backgrounds, right? I study sociology, psychology, and a sociology Italian. And so, and we came, we arrived at translation almost out of desperation. Um, we were in these spaces, we're having these conversations, but outside of Italy, people are not thinking about, you know, such a, what a burgeoning culture it is to be black in Italy, right? And then within Italy, there is a, there is a rejection Right within within the narrative of what one can be Italian, within the images that we even showed showed you, who can claim Italianness, Italianita, who can you know claim an affinity for it, um, and what that can look like. And often, when folks who are attempting to claim it at the same time attempt to sort of critique it, um, that experience exists here too. Where it's like, well, then why don't you go back to where you belong? For many of these people, that is where they belong. Um, that is the only home they've ever known. That's the only language they have access to. And so our work often when we're talking to each other, when we're translating some things like even in the, in the excerpt that Candace read, um, the Italian version does not say I am a man, it says Io sono una persona, mi sa. And, um, no, dice yeah. che sono un uomo. Sono un uomo. Um, and uomo is, a, is, a, is an, in some ways an ungendered word. If we were to translate it, it could have been I am a person, right? I am a human. Um, but it was... There's a decision that was made, Kenneth, and perhaps you can talk about it too, about choosing to gender it, um, gender, you know, and personify Somalia Sako as, as a man um, within the discourse of the translation and the effort to make his story accessible outside of Italy. Yeah, um, so for that, like you shared, Barbara, I did go back and forth about you making it I am a man or um, I am a human being or I am a person. Um, and just through conversations with different translators, I settled on I am a man for a few reasons. Um, one, um, I was also just thinking about like the um, the phrase I am a man in the context at least of civil rights in the US but also in Italy um, to say that I am a human being is uh, pretty contested because folks in Italy if they're claiming that they don't have race then well then we're all human beings right then we're all monkeys is, that's what they say so um, to have I am a man helps I think just um, center the fact that this is um, there are multiple layers here. There is, of course, that um, gendered racial layer here. It's not just I am a human being. So the question of gender neutrality did come to mind, but I wanted that um, particular uh, piece about um, specifically how uh, 
yet gender, um, and also race by specifically saying, I am a man come through in Italian into English. And often because we translate uh, women, they talk a lot in the N-word, the Italian equivalent of the N-word shows up because unfortunately, some of the stories that we translate are deeply steeped in the traumas of existing in the black body in an Italian context um, and the ways in which people are violent with, are violent with language, right, um, for folk. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about if, you know, the Italian equivalent is negra, but it's not just, if we cannot translate it directly into English in that way, uh, because often the context within which the word is used has a lot to talk to tell us about what the person is being called, right? Like, are they being called a prostitute? Are they being called easy? Are they being called subhuman? Are they being called um, unwelcome? And so we spend, a, sometimes we've spent hours just thinking about one word um, in context and trying to figure out how to make that word accessible, legible to a, a, an English reader, while at the same time not diminishing the power and impact of that word as it was, as it was, it can and was experienced in the Italian context. Um, at the same time, because we work uh, predominantly with living authors, um, and our, our our function as translators is really steeped in intentional community and and and. Like we, we approach translation as an act of justice. Uh, everything we translate when possible, we share with our, our original authors to really be in partnership with them and to kind of discuss, are, are the choices we're making the choices you would make, right? Um, this is why we chose this word. This is why we thought this was the right idea. What are your thoughts on this? How could it be different? Are we landing where you want us to? Are we, especially for women, are we, um, diminishing your voice in any way? Are we policing your anger? If the anger is there, are we having that anger come across in that same way? Can someone who has no access to the Italian culture, context, language, or experience still understand what story you're trying to tell and how it's being told? Um, before we you know, before we get to the place where we start off a presentation or we read up an excerpt of what we've translated for, for the audience. So this is who we are, this is what we do. We're going to pause here and open up space for conversation and questions if folks have it. Um, happy to chat more if needed. Thank you so much. Uh, wow, and uh, this was uh, pretty powerful. So, and and I really appreciate you beginning by reading your work. Uh, you just mentioned uh, Barbara that. Uh, you came, both of you came from social science background. I was actually pretty struck by the way that the power of the of, of the English language, the, the way in which you were able to capture in, in English uh, the, uh, the the pathos, the, the the passion and the trauma and, and the anger, like you said, of uh, of the authors as well. So thank you so much. I really appreciate. Um, let's, uh, I have some questions, but I want to make sure that everybody here gets uh, a chance to ask questions and hopefully our students as well. Uh, but everybody who's here, please uh, uh, unmute yourself and feel free to ask the questions or if you have asked it in the chat, let me double check. Um, we're we're uh, pretty uh, flowing here. So please feel free to unmute and ask the question. Sonia? <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much for the incredible work you've done. Um, um, I have a question about the, you know, the, the il linguaggio inclusivo that it's being, um, you know, it's pretty new in Italy. And I've noticed that uh, Futuri is published by FQ, which is one of the few, um, you know, publisher that use the, inclusiveness of the language, meaning that, um, you know, instead of using the, the plural um, men, I mean, masculine plural to indicate, um, you know, a, a, a public of, of people, then they started to use the schwa, which is one of the phonetic sounds uh, for the singular and the long schwa for the plural. So I was wondering, do you, uh, do you use that kind of, um, how do you translate that kind of language into, um, into English or does it challenge you more? Is that a, 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 you know, an additional challenge that you find? 
Um, I'll jump in. Um, so um, when um, reading the text, the stories, um, all of the protagonists do have the you know uh, endings of like um, like the standard endings in Italian. Um, but there's one story um, by Alessa Herrero called um, uh, called the Pure C'era un odore di pioggia, and yet there was still a smell of rain. Um, where um, throughout translating um, and in conversation with the author, um, there are gender fluid characters. And so we've, and also we've just like discussed with the author how um, to address the pronouns of the, of um, one of the characters, well, actually all of them, but um, in particular, there was one um, that has um, a role at the beginning. And um, in the Italian, um, it actually wasn't as, um, clear as you would uh, um uh, we, we had to actually speak with the translate with the original author to actually tease out what the um pronouns were and what the um just to get more of an understanding about that particular uh, character but we talked about the all the characters with the author to make sure that the pronouns and the way that we situated the characters themselves throughout the entire story was honoring the way that the original author wanted the characters to exist I think that's the bigger kind of our process is always uh, we want to be careful right with the words that we're being given permission to translate and so in in as much as we can do that uh, food today shra actually is fairly new um in the last two maybe years i think is when it's jumped to prominence probably in the last year um when we were both living in italy in 2016 it wasn't as prominent and so folks weren't um gender neutral language or gender fluid language wasn't as common amongst the peers within with whom we were spending time with um and that language the us the english language is probably more expansive for that than the italian languages and so it leaves room for interpretation on our end um with permission from the original writer Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Anne Donaday. I teach uh, in the department and um, my work is on um, similar issues, but in the French context. And um, I very much, I, I found the, the, the text that you selected very moving and uh, representative in very different ways of the richness of, of this literature. Um, and I really appreciated your, your comments about the complexity of the translation of trying to render context, uh, terms from one context to another and trying to find sort of relevant um, references that could speak to uh, an American audience, uh, but still retain or like something of the original context. Um, and so I have like a specific question and a more general one. The specific question was um, when, um, for, from, for the first story, um, when the character says, you project your heart of darkness fantasies onto us. I was wondering if heart of darkness was the reference in the original or if it, or if that was kind of like a, a transposition for something that we might know over here. And then the other question more generally is, um, are there some new concepts that don't exist in the US that some of these authors are creating that we might want to think about or know about here? Okay, I got the first question. I know that one's for me. Can you please repeat the second one? Sorry, I found myself like wheels turning. Please repeat the second one. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the second one is, you know, you, you talked about how we have a language to talk about issues of racism in the US. We've been thinking about those issues for a very long time. We've had a lot of scholars and, and activists who have created concepts. But I was wondering if there are some new concepts that maybe are developed or new terms that are created by the writers who you translated that we might want to know about, like want to learn from them in terms of 
new ways to conceptualize things or new terms that may be helpful? Um, okay, thank you. So I will reply to the first one. Um, I'm going off of memory. I think it was Heart of Darkness, but I'm gonna have to um, double check. I think it was. Um, the second one, I think for me, the largest, I don't say the largest, but a takeaway that I've uh, gotten from just approaches is, um, you know, the question about like how to approach questions of, you know, how like uh, labels and how claiming something before someone claims it for you. And so um, Barbara and I have used um, African Italian or Afro Italian. Um, we've seen it hyphened, we've seen it unhyphened. Um, that's a relatively new label. Um, folks have uh, started using it over the past you know, couple of years, especially just due to like online conversations. Um, but there are different ways that folks, um, you know, identify. And there's still a lot of just conversations about it, right? But essentially the question is, what do you claim before someone else claims it for you? Um, and um, what I've learned from um, uh, women who are um, doing the work is I've noticed the way that they will describe folks is just by saying like Af uh, Afrodescendenti, which I would say is like African descendants. Um, and I think the good thing about that is it provides space for folks without um, assuming that folks claim a certain way. For example, Jada Khan has a piece where she says, don't call me Italian, that's the title, um, which um, Barbara's very uh, familiar with because she translated that one. Um, uh, but, um, you know, you'll have writers like Ijaba Shega who will say it, but they've also spoken about their tension with it. You'll find other writers who will take on the term, but then you have others who Barbara, uh, who I translated, right, Jada Khan, who may fit under the umbrella of African Italian or Afro-Italian, um, but she rejects that term. So I found African descendants to be helpful, but I'll also pass it to Barbara. Yeah, I, it's an interesting question because the, the process of creating language is happening right now. Um, I think where, whereas you, you mentioned within the U.S. context, perhaps even in the French context um, and in other contexts of, of other languages, maybe there's a process there for, for which to pull in a pre-existing term redefine it. Um, in, in, in Italy, the words just haven't existed. So um, one really quick example, Candice and I, when we're living um, in Italy, we were invited to a conversation in a loft in Milan where there were a group of Black Italian folk, about 20 to 30, who were literally trying to decide what to call themselves. Like, are we Afro-Italian? Are we Italo-Ganese, italo Somalo, like how are we, what, where does the hyphen exist? Is there a hyphen, right? How do we, how, what, do we have a collective term that connects us or is, is creating a collectivity amongst us in some ways diminishing our individuality? And these are conversations, right, that in the, in, when you think, when I think about it, the resonance for that is perhaps during the civil rights um, era in the United States, um, perhaps like post post colonialism in France and other places, but in Italy it's happening right now. Um, so perhaps if this question were to be asked a year from now, we might have a very different answer than we do right now. Thank you. Sorry, just to go back and it said um, in the original Cuore di Tenebra in uh, Incivilita, and so I translated it as Heart of Darkness when just, yeah. Um, looking at the text that's titled that and what it's evoking and what so, Jada was um, attempting to evoke through that piece. Yeah. So, so it was a reference to Conrad then? I took it as a reference to Conrad and then when I yeah. spoke with Jada, it was fine. Yeah, thank you. I, I see a message in the chat from Jennifer Voigt. Does Jennifer wanna ask the question directly? Oh, Dr. Chow, it was not a question, just, the, it was just the comment. It was just the comment on um, the perspectives that were presented by the author, but put upon as being the perspective of somebody else. And um, it's hard to hear that sometimes because I don't share those perspectives as a white person. 
but I think we all have to have these as um, it, it how we all have to share all of these um, so that we break down those barriers of this is how a white person is or thinks this is how a black person is or thinks this is how a Italian person is or thinks. So it wasn't so much a question, but a comment. Um, very amazing ladies. Just this was really, um, this was real helpful to watch. Thank you. Yes, they, absolutely. We do need to acknowledge uh, the uh, the dominant uh, culture, and, and and you know, oftentimes the uh, damages that the dominant culture does. And in this case, in certainly in the European context, uh, as much as in the U.S., the dominant culture is the white culture. So thank you for sharing. Are there other questions? Please feel free to unmute uh, yourselves uh, um, and, and ask the question. Otherwise, I'll, I'll have to ask questions and I don't wanna do it because I can do it otherwise. So there's a question in the chat, a bit of a lighter question, but for myself, the greatest difficulty when it comes to reading Italian literature is getting through all the idioms, references, phrases, and general language that only someone growing up in Italy would know. How do you as a translator work around things like these? That's great. Um, me personally, I have, when I'm translating, I have like eight dictionaries open. Like in the, when we're talking tactically, how do you translate? Um, they're drafts. So, um, a first to third draft might have a lot of brackets. What is this saying? What does this even mean? Um, and, and that's also the beauty, I think, of co-translating. Candace and I came to Italian at different times for different reasons, um, and we've lived in different places in the country. And so we our access, even the way we speak Italian is a little differently. Um, I, I learned Italian in Tuscany, so I have a, um, a bit of a Tuscan you know, dialect kind of in there as well. Candace learned Italian in Bologna, um, there's a little bit there. I lived in Padova, et cetera. And so beyond kind of like the getting the words translated as much as possible um, and using dictionaries as much, I think the other part too is our one collaboration. Um, no draft of, no translation have I ever done has gone into the public without Candace taking a look first as at least my, my alpha reader, right? Um, and then from there, there are other few people who look at it. Um, up till now, I haven't, I haven't yet done a translation that has gone public without the original writer, author taking a look as well. Um, it's important to me, even if they don't speak Italian, even if they don't speak or read English, for me to talk them through what my thoughts were and explain it. If it takes one hour, if it takes eight, that's important. Um, and then, then there's also the, 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 the last level of, we both have trusted colleagues and friends who are um, Italian speakers, Italian um, cultural thinkers. Also, I think, again, because we came from a social, uh, social science background, most of the people we are in relationship with, even if they're not translators themselves or linguists, they are thinking about the culture within which we have chosen to, to you know, um, exist. And so, a lot of that is also asking them references about that. There's a phrase here, I don't know what it means. Could you help me think through it? Um, or I think this could be this because there isn't a, an equitable, tangible reflection of that phrase in English. Is this equitable? Like if I explain to you what it means in English, does that make sense? Is it accessible? Um, and so we do a lot of that, but our, our partnership is very much that we are, we trust each other a lot. And so we're always asking each other the hard questions. Yes, and to add on top of what Barbara shared, um, I would extend our community to also just folks who are translators in general may not, you know, they've only read the, the English translation. Um, I found that to be really helpful with making sure that I find the right uh, word. Um, and, you know, in the end, right, like, we're trying our best to make our interpretation legible. Like, that's really what we're trying. For me, that's how I anchor what I'm doing. And so I'd like that interpretation to be clear to folks who may not be familiar with Italian, who may not ever read the original. Um, and I also think too that um, working with like getting feedback from other translators that don't know the source language, or let's say the original language, um, they are 
helpful for just being a little bit creative too, right? Because you don't want, you want to find that balance between, you know, where do you, where are you able to make decisions and where does, you know, let's say this uh, has to, this, this has to be in the, you know, from the original text per se, right? So there has to be some type of balance and Barbara and I are still working through that. I know I am, um, but having friends that don't, uh, that haven't read the original are helpful. Um, also, from my experience, it can really just yeah, vary with, you know, asking someone to read for specific eyes to on the text, whether they know the uh, original or not. Um, I'll just jump in to the second. Let's see, we have two. Uh, what advice can you give to students who might want to pursue translation sometime in their careers? And have you found that the original authors are readily amenable to meeting with you on that? Um, I'll jump to the second one because I think that's a smooth transition and then I'll go to the first one. Um, so since the authors are living, they are aware that this is a project of care. Um, they are um, also, many of them are doing the groundwork themselves. They are available um, to meet and um, discuss. And so um, we've uh, been just trying to get in um, you know, conversation with um, all of them. And then as we translate each piece, we um, reach out to them. They do know that we are translating the text. They have advocated for us to be the translators, which I think is also just like a testament of how we really try and anchor this in um, community. Can I move on, Barbara? Okay, cool. The second question, what advice can you give to students who might want to pursue translation sometime in their careers? I'm going to be frank and just I'll just speak for myself. I, um, I have a full time job in international education and I do translation for me as yeah, a project of care. You could call it labor of love if you want, despite, of course, all the tensions with that and capitalism. Um, but I am able to do translation because I have another job that allows me to do it. But there are full-time translators. I just am able to select projects that allow me to do the projects that I want to do. So I, I, there's a certain privilege I'm trying to evoke, I think, with my experience and choice, but I can't speak for other translators. Yeah, I think both, for both Candice and I, we, we both have jobs that have nothing to do with language um, or translation and that allow us to eat. I think that's like a real thing, right? We came, neither of us, and I think we've also, it's been interesting for us because as translator, we came to translation with a really clear and firm politic. Um, and our politic is we want to make these stories accessible. Our politic is we want to always be in relationship with our original authors. Our politic is that we want to be careful and with care when we're translating. Our politic is that we are centered always in justice work. And so because these are our politics um, that allow us to really be intentional about the things that we translate. We're not translating because we want the fame. We're not translating because we want, you know, the money. Translation will not get you a ton of money. Um, but if you are someone who's interested in investing in translation or curious about it, I would say try. Because what we also really, it took me almost four months to translate my first story. Um, it's, a, it's a lot. It was just an arduous process with lots of drafts and lots of people taking a look at it. Um, and then from there, you know, it kind of kept going. A lot of people talk about translation being an incredibly lonely um, process. It hasn't been for me because I have Candice and we collaborate, we translate together. And when we say we're collaborators, we're not translating. We haven't yet translated the same thing at the same time. We're each working on our, our individual projects separately from each other, but we're always in conversation with each other while we're doing it. Um, some people translate in tandem and we're not that kind of collaborators. And so it hasn't been lonely for me, but it's because we've been intentional, right? We're clear about the why behind it. We're clear about what we want to get out of it. And we're clear about with whom we want to do that kind of work. I have a question for you on that topic too um, that just came to my mind. You know, before uh, women were actually allowed to publish and write literature, the, their main um, job as you know, in, in literature and writing was translating. Um, and sometimes like I think about uh, Mary Pen um, uh, Penbrook who translated the Psalms in the 1500 in England. She brought a lot of, you know, herself into the translation and she actually um, choose the words so that, you know, the, the discourse was going to another um, way. <laughs> and she actually, 
you know, that was one way for her to um, bring the, the, her like womanhood into uh, literature. Although she was, you know, every translator is a second, um, well, how do you say, like, it's, it's not the, you know, you don't really note it in the book. I mean, the author is the one that you, you note, but the translator is the second, um, I wouldn't say it's second hand, but, um, but yeah, I get, you get the sense. So my question is <laughs> how much of you do you bring into your, into your translations or into your books? <laughs> yeah, Nazar was like, ah, how much of us ourselves are we bringing into it? Um, all right, I think I'll start with, I think, Barbara and I, like Barbara shared, right, we have a very clear politic that guides our work. And I think that ultimately just, yeah, is embedded within how we approach it, how we do it. Um, again, like, at least for me, the translation is an interpretation that I'm trying to make legible. And the way that I do it is guided by the fact that this is a project of care. And I want that what comes on the page is, um, you know, well, well represents the author's ideas. So, I mean, I know, and I think also like this question to me also just sounds like, should the translator be invisible or not? And I personally don't think that the translator should be invisible because I'm we're doing the work, right? Like we're part of this process. And I think what Barbara and I have been doing is we've been talking about our work is um, we've made it like very clear multiple times, right? That we are translating this, this is what's guiding us. And so I think, you know, for me, I see Barbara and I as also like, we're not making ourselves invisible in our process and our work invisible. And when I hear that question, how much of yourself do you put in it? To me, it sounds like, am I trying to make myself invisible? Of course, we're also trying to find that right balance between our own decisions and um, like, let's say our creativity and yeah. respecting that of the author. So, um, but I'll also pass it to Barbara. Yeah. No, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that you you that the, the implication was that you had to be invisible but to the contrary how much of yourself do you put in the in the book i mean how much does your you know experience your background get into the book yeah um I, 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 it's like such a hard question because every because i think for us we're choosing the works that we're translating right so because I am always choosing what I want to translate inherently myself, who I am and my, my, my politic, as we've talked about, is inherently embedded in, in the translation because I, I'm choosing to translate a text written by a Haitian Italian who has spent her whole life passing as white while kind of unpacking her identity, right? Um, I'm choosing to translate a text by a Ghanaian Italian woman who's saying, don't call me Afro Italian. The only place that I have ever migrated was from my mother's uterus. Like they're like there's like very specific and like these but the writers are tra we translate generally are actually I don't want to say angry, but like they have they're really they have really strong feelings about who how they are seen and how they exist. And I think they do because we do, right? Um, like there's an affinity we have to them because of the questions we had already found ourselves asking, and that's the reason why we found ourselves to the work that they are writing. Um, sometimes we, Candice will translate a paragraph and she'll ask me, hey, can you, what are your thoughts on this paragraph? The only way I can answer her is to translate that paragraph on my own to see if I will arrive at the exact same place that she does. Um, we'll share a link actually of, we did a project together where there's an Ita Italian Somalian um, poet named um, Rahmanor. She has a poem called Linguistic Threads or Fili Linguistici. Candice, myself, and a third translator each separately from each other translated the exact same poem to see how we would arrive at like, a, like a, a, the finished thing, right? And I think, so that question is, and you see in that translation that we got there because of our influences um, and who we are as people and how we interpreted the text. Translation is inherently interpretation. Um, and so who I am inherently decides on how the, the rendering that, that becomes possible, um, if that answers your question. And at the same time, like we're trying to figure out tone, like I've all of my authors sound diff have different tone. 
Um, the one that I read, she is a Fanonian scholar. She spends a lot of time reading Franz Fanon. And so she's very heady in her philosophy. Um, so I have to figure out how to sort of really render that like headiness of thinking about, you know, you know, philosophy and, you know, the fact of blackness and whatever, and then pivot immediately if I'm translating somebody else who's like a comedian, right? And is not really interested in the philosophy, but is interested in the sarcasm, um, which are not the same. Um, and I have to kind of make sure those different distinct voices are distinct for the reader. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you, uh, Barbara and Candice, the question that you're always getting asked, <laughs> which is, uh, who, you know, the who gets to translate, and I want to sort of uh, tie it to um, a debate a, a few months ago uh, on uh, uh, who got to translate uh, Amanda Gorman's uh, inaugural poem in Europe. Uh, which you know sort of became a, a cause uh, celeb. Do uh, you have to be uh, black to interpret? Um, you know, like in the intentionality. Sort of, I, I wonder whether you want to offer some uh, um, ideas of, uh, about this particular topic as well, because uh, um, you know it is uh, you know in the politics of translation. Uh, it, it is there regardless. Uh, you know, like we, we are making decisions uh, um, and, and we're making deliberate decisions and, and as you are point, you have pointed out as well. But there is also a, uh, a, a particular, uh, um, you know, like po political view and point of view that uh, has been invisible, has been uh, unacknowledged, that has been uh, a, a damage that we also want to honor, that we also want to bring up. So I, I wonder whether you want to sort of add to this debate of who gets to translate? Okay, I'll pass it to you. All right, all right. Um, so, I mean, I think for, um, Barbara, I'm going to pass it back to you. Cause I'm going to pass it back to you because Barbara, Barbara gets to it a bit, much faster and better than I do. I'm going to pass it to Barbara. We're going to say the same thing, but Barbara's going to say it in like a couple sentences and I'm going to say it in like a par two paragraphs. So this is also thinking about co-translation, right? We have very different personalities and very different ways of communicating. I think like, and so it's the partnership works because we're very different from each other. And, and so our interpretation, back to your question, Sonia, um, how, how our individual selves kind of shows up on this page is distinctly different because of who we are. And you can tell even when we work on the same projects. Um, so the question of who gets to translate, I have been known to respond to that as it's kind of a lazy question, right? Because it, because often it's framed as well, if Amanda Gorman being a black woman is translating and there was, there was you know, a lot of outrage because a white person was you know, brought to translate them, should only black people or should people of similar identities translate others of similar identities? I do not believe so. However, if you are going to translate a text, no matter what it is, and I think often translation is, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's beneath the surface, um, maybe what you're trying to imply a little bit, Sonia, it's beneath the surface because what is often put on the page is the author, right? And then the translator who rendered the language and story accessible is often invisibilized. Even though they have as much power, they're in fact a co-author of the work once rendered in a different language. Um, I think if no matter what it is, if it's like Peppa Pig or if it's you know a translation about you know the Haitian revolution or whatever, the translator, I believe should do the work of understanding the context from which they are rent they're taking that work and the context to which that work is going to land, right? And if you are a translator who does not necessarily have the similar identity to the right the original author, you need to understand: Are you the right person to be doing this work, right? Um, something that I often ask myself is: I am the right am I the right home for this? Um, when we were starting Future, the project. Candace and I both read the book in its entirety and we picked the stories that resonated with us individually. 
That's a choice that we wanted to make. And we made that choice because if I'm going to be spending months and months in a story, I want to make sure that I am doing a good job, that I'm being careful with it. And that when other people have access to it, who never knew what the original was, that I am, I was careful enough that they are able to arrive at the same place I arrived when I first read the original text. And so who should get to translate? The person who's willing to do the work necessary to understand what is being translated to understand their own positionality without within that process, even before they put pen to paper and do that work. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for, um, and Candice for sharing this. Um, please uh, feel free to ask other, other questions. I do wanna, uh, uh, I do wanna ask a follow-up question, which is kind of uh, piggy uh, piggybacking and, you know, relating to what Anne Donaday, my colleague here, uh, asked you before. And it's uh, the other, tr translating the other way around, because of course you, you have uh, taken up this, uh, this uh, job as a labor of love uh, or a, a labor of care, as Candice has characterized it. Uh, but I also want to mention that uh, in Italy, a lot of uh, uh, your peers in Italy have done the other way around of translating works, uh, you, you know, English works into Italian, works by Black scholars, for instance. So I wonder whether you can also uh, talk about this, because this is the politic of translation becomes, translation becomes a way of uh, embracing uh, also a particular culture and wanting to, uh, you know, we've, we've commented on the fact that, uh, you know, perhaps uh, there is uh, something that Europe, and in this case, in particular, uh, Black identities in Europe or in Italy can actually contribute to the discussion around Blackness in the diaspora. Uh, but, you know, in Italy also, uh, Afro-Italian or uh, Black, uh, 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 you know, youth want to translate, is translating works by, um, by African-American scholars in, in, in the case specific. So I wonder whether, you know, you, you, were, you were just offering also the Saidia Hartman uh, 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 work has been translated. So I wonder whether you can talk to, uh, about that as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think like what I mentioned, we came to it. Well, Candice really said it really aptly. We, it's it's not a labor it's not a labor of love, but you know it's a, it's an act of care. I think on the flip side, it's actually like a labor of protection. So Marie Moise, who I whose work I um, I translated and read out loud, translated Angela Davis's uh, race class um, race woman, race, and class from, from English to Italian. Um, Sadia Hartman's work, Lose Your Mother, has been translated. Um, James Baldwin is being translated. Tony Morrison is being translated. Uh, a lot of these things, right? An exam and people are doing this work because when, and this might be a, a bit of a roundabout response to your question, Clarissa, but when, 20, when George Floyd was murdered last year and the movement of Black Lives resurged, um, resuscitated effectively across transnational borderlands. What happened was that people in Italy were also taking to the streets to protest racism in the United States. And black folk and people, non-white people in Italy were saying, but what about us? What about here, right? And often the erasure that happens in diminishing one's identity of being simultaneously Italian and other, right? is that people's stories and existences are not allowed to, to, be, to be told, to be like, to be unpacked, to be humanized in the ways that we allow, for better or worse, within Italy at least, a look elsewhere. And so folks are translating these works into English because I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lack of language, right? How can we talk about racism if whenever someone says race, they're like, well, razza means breed, we're not animals, thus we can't be racist. Um, that is an immediate erasure of the trauma that exists there. And so this process of translation is also a process of inventing language as a way of, you know, then making the conversations possible. Yeah, I think um, on top of the language question, right, it's folks are translating and it's also not just like a mere like translate it and you have the language. Um, in the U.S., let's say, for example, we think about things where it's like this is a race topic or this is um, you know gender studies or this is um, whatever type of department you want to label it as whereas in Italy it's kind of all labeled on top of each other um, it's all just wrapped into one and so you see a lot of these um, 
just like intersectional movements that are occurring where when folks are, um, you know, organizing for citizenship. They're also organizing for folks who are um, migrants who may, you know, just have, you know, that are maybe a, like recently arrived, let's say, um, LGBTQ and a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, were literally that just um, addressing all of these intersections where in the US, it's like, this is one movement and this is the other and this is the focus. But in Italy, they um, overlap a lot. There's a really big effort right now to think about, to you know, translate the concepts of intersectionality, right? Um, Kimberly Crenshaw and Angela Davis and Audre Lorde and all these other things. Folks are bringing them into Italian language in accessible Italian context and dialects so that people can say, when I talk, if, if you see me, a black person, you're not just saying, oh, I'm, I'm an African, I am Italian, I am, Tus I am from Tuscany, I am queer, I am whatever it is that these multi layers of my identity and all of them make it possible for my existence to be or not be here. And one cannot be separated from the other. And I think in the US for better or worse, we're a little further along in that discourse than, we, than Italy is. Thank you. I, I, I'm just checking also if the, I see the thank you coming in. Oh, there's a, a question uh, from Daniela. Daniela, do you want to mute yourself and uh, ask the question? Yeah, oh, it's the same. I just want to, I, because I, I love to hear stories of cooperation and agreement, but I would like I would like to know if there is a disagreement on some. I'm, I'm curious about stories, specific stories on passages or words or, you know, subjects that made you discuss, okay, and struggle in a way. <laughs> Candice, I think Somalia Sako took you a very long time because you were struggling a lot with um, like niggerly, niggardly, all those different words, right? Yeah, that one took, um, yeah, a lot of time. I think, uh, like you said, Barbara, a lot of um, drafts um, and just trying to evoke certain, um, uh, yeah, emotions or feelings, what they were trying to communicate, essentially. Um, I think when I made the N-word um, an adjective by adding ly that wasn't in the original that was just um i'd have to go back to the original and double check um but um i do remember that was uh they did say the n-word but i was trying to get that specific um uh idea across and if i didn't turn it as an adjective it wouldn't have been to me it wouldn't have been possible in that moment i think i'd, I'd have to go back and um see but I think um, in terms of disagreeing I think like Barbara said the beauty of our relationship is that we're different and we both um, have a very we're very like open to different perspectives on how we do things and we're okay with asking each other like questions that may be hard or difficult um, and um, just sit with it and see what the other says um, and take it from there. I think in terms of pace, Candace is like if we're going to talk about you know, Candace is very very like patient uh, with her translations, right? Um, very patient in really sitting with the word or word choice for a long time before arriving at a, at a possible. Um, and I am less patient because like I'll read a word and I say, well, this it must be this, and so not necessarily disagreements, but they're often arriving at a, at a conclusion where. Um, like I'll arrive at a word really quickly and Candace will challenge and say like, that, I don't know if that's the word. Could you think about it differently? Like, what could it be if it wasn't this? Or the opposite is true where sometimes I'm like, you're bouncing around all these options. It is that one word, just settle on it. Um, and so <laughs> there is um, a little bit of a push pull that happens where um, she's telling me to slow down and I'm telling her to, you know, trust herself a little bit more. Well, I have not been very mindful of the time. I know some of the comments, some of the colleagues and students have left. Of course, uh, I realize that we are, you know, within a particular slot uh, of uh, opportunities here for classes. And I'm also 
want to be mindful of your time, uh, Barbara and Candice, for, uh, you know, like I just want to take the, if there are any pressing questions, uh, please say them, uh, you know, write them now or unmute yourself now. I see that, um, oh, Alessandro, I see that you have a question. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Yes, hello. <laughs> Um, thank you for sharing with us. Um, I'm going back to Candace's first reading. Um, there's themes of migrants being treated as just migrants. And, you know, there's when people see or hear the word migrants, you sometimes know or, or intuit that there's a derogatory uh, connotation or you see migrants being, you know, perceived as like subhuman as opposed to as opposed to human beings. So my question is, in the context of Italy, how important is access to citizenship and people of colors or migrants' ability to be perceived as legitimate human beings that are owed dignity and respect like their native peers? Thanks. I'm going to repeat back. The question because I think so your question is how important is access to citizenship in POC migrants um, perceived as legitimate compared to their peers yeah okay gotcha um so I think with um within the citizenship debate right you see folks um demanding that they get citizenship because they have been um living there um, and I think that it's also just like a regular challenge about why these policies exist, how they are exclusionary, um, how they put people on the margins. Um, and in terms of, and so um, it's not just when we have the citizenship debate too, it's often um, uh, led by folks who are who have been uh, like youth who have been living in Italy. Um, and then typically when folks in Italy um, say migrants, they're talking about folks who may have recently um, arrived. Um, but I think that's how they typically use the language. Um, and then I think in terms of comparison, like how are they, um, you know, uh, perceived compared to let's say their peers that already have citizenship, let's say. Um, I mean, I think citizenship in Italy is also often just, yeah, equated to like uh, whiteness or like this type of default race. So oh. um, anyone who is not belonging to that is considered other and is considered a threat, let's say, to this um, borderland that Italy has. Um, and so whether you are used to uh, demanding that you have citizenship because you've been living there, or whether you're someone who um, is working in fields, collecting um, uh, vegetables and fruit, for example, so that way the nation can survive. Um, there are all of these, essentially, if you are not white, you're considered a threat, but nonetheless, this borderland survives on you not being, um, not uh, being recognized as a citizen and also um, as an individual. Um, so right. I hope that um, answers part of your question. Can I add something yeah. to you? I think beyond just a recognition, right? So for both Candice and I, when people meet us, or at least for me, right, I'm, I'm, I'm darker complexioned. Within Italy, I'm much more easily read as African. Um, when people immediately meet me, the way they treat me shifts immediately if I introduce myself as being from Ghana or if I introduce myself as being from New York, right? Um, and, or be having grown up in the United States. So kind of thinking about the question that you're asking and kind of what Candace is talking about too, it's, yes, it's the perception of legitimacy or being legitimized as a human being is, it's not just like, oh, you have the papers, thus you're human, but it's, it's also like, how do I treat you? Like, are you oh. taking up space that I, is supposed to be mine? Um, but then there's other thing where it's like citizenship is tangible. If you are not a person, if you don't have citizenship in Italy, you cannot do Erasmus, for example, which is like a very like tangible part, like coming of age process for many European youth. If you do not have citizenship, you cannot, you know, if, if while growing up, your family 
which immigrated from Nigeria or whatever, had a hard time because racism in Italy is real and people can't get jobs. And even if they do, the economy is not great, so they can't get money. Their family says, we're going to send you to Nigeria for six months because it'll help us be able to sustain life here. You have you, Your timeline starts all over again, right, to acquire citizenship. And so they're really tangible way beyond including but beyond sort of like I see you as human because you have the papers it's like I am able to move through space in very real ways because I have these documents that acknowledges me as existing and being part of this cultural you know fabric that is considered Italian got it and and if I can add to that um you know a lot of a lot of it has to do also with fame and how much money you have, because I don't think anybody has a problem with Balotelli considering him, considering him like Italian, you know, because he plays in uh, whatever team, like I don't even know, um, or like KB Lane. Um, I just recently read a, an article about KB Lane, who is not a citizen, he is like one of the G2. Um, however, because he was very famous or he became very famous, I, I think he is one of the first TikToker uh, in Italy. Now they're, they're willing to grant him citizenship. So uh, I don't know where that, you know, has to do a lot of also with, with how much money or power you have or how much, you know, a celebrity you became, unfortunately. Well, part of even being able to beyond sort of being beyond kind of like, okay, your timeline has hit, you are eligible for citizenship. Citizenship is inaccessible in Italy because of financial restrictions, right? You have to have a certain amount of, of, of financial, like money to your name. So there are communities of people who pull their money together. You know, Candace is up for citizenship. Let's all put our money in Candace's bank account. So Candace can apply for citizenship and prove that she can survive and has the money great, Candace got citizenship, now let's move all our money to Clarissa so Clarissa can do the same thing. There's like an inherent, there's two things happening simultaneously, the, the fight for citizenship and the access to it really requires that people be in community with each other. And at the same time, the system is set up in a way that it alienates people from each other, right? And so both are true at the same time and there's like a lot of tension that exists there. We've been going a while. Are there any final questions? <laughs> Thank you, Barbara, for taking uh, leadership here. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, like I think we should uh, we, we should stop here. Though you know, we, it, we I think it would also be the case that we'd love to have you back. <laughs> I can already uh, see this happening as well. Um, th this has been fabulous. I, I just want to thank uh, your, you for your work, for your generosity in sharing it with us. And uh, uh, everybody, you know, even those who have already left, because I know they've got other stuff uh, going on, as we all do. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, uh, uh, for the work you do, and, and I hope we'll stay in touch. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining us. Thank you. I'm just letting everybody go. Yeah, we're gonna turn off the recording. How do we <laughs> stop the recording? I think uh, did uh, I think my co-host left. <laughs> Hold on, let me let me stop it. If you have a second to 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 stay behind, let me just uh, um, make sure. Oh, I can I could stop the recording right there. <laughs>